Hey. So uh, <clears throat> this is going to be, uh, well, I've been asked by the Open Virtualization Alliance to talk to you guys about KVM, which is a little, in this audience, is a little bit like talking to oceanographers about water. So I'm not, uh, not sure how much you're going to get out of this, but we'll, uh, we'll go for it anyway. Um, I'm from uh, Intel IT Engineering. And uh, <clears throat> what we've been uh, uh, doing is uh, we've, we've done a few private cloud installations of our own. Uh, cloud isn't our only business in IT. Obviously, we, uh, we uh, have a significant uh, little side business making chips. So uh, we have a design environment as well. And there's, there's been some play uh, in that field as well. And it's not necessarily cloud related. So I'm going to talk about both, even though uh, this is a cloud audience. So what are we up to at, uh, at Intel IT? Well, when it comes to uh, open source and open stack, we want to we wanna help bring open stack and open source generally to the enterprise table. And uh, I think there's a lot of sessions going on around here uh, this week about uh, uh, enterprise readiness for open stack, et cetera. But one thing that is genuinely enterprise ready, and I think nobody here is going to be surprised by it, is, is KVM as a hypervisor. Um, when it comes to KVM, uh, we definitely want to, as Intel, we want to leverage our competitive advantage. We think KVM runs best on Intel architecture, naturally. Uh, it exposes uh, all of our wonderful chipset features uh, natively. And uh, we also want to support and encourage the development community. And uh, a, a good portion of the KVM development community is actually in Intel, some of it anyway. Um, and of course, we're doing that through things like the we're a member of the Open Virtualization Alliance, which is why the slides have those titles on them and not a bunch of Intel blue. So what about KVM? Well, um, these numbers aren't going to look very exciting to some of you, I'm sure, especially anybody that's doing public cloud. But uh, this is just kind of a little bit of a background of what we've done. Um, our initial deployment, our, my involvement with OpenStack goes back to uh, Cactus. Um, we ended up deploying a, a, a production uh, private cloud back in 2012 on Essex. Uh, our version of KVM at that time was uh, the uh, 1.0 uh, release. I, I don't know if everybody knows the difference between uh, the Quimu system x86-64 and the one down here at the bottom, the uh, Quimu KVM.15.1. There's a bit of a, a divergence in the, in the code base in KVM that you get one or the other depending on what distribution you're running. Um, that one, uh, we had about 1,000 virtual instances for uh, external services. We uh, um, deployed that, like I say, on Essex. It felt very early and fresh and new to us. Um, it's old hat now, of course. Um, our current deployments, uh, we have multiple uses. I pointed this out earlier. We've got uh, cloud, but then we've also got uh, our, our engineering space so for design engineering. So um, when it comes to cloud, we've got a Grizzly deployment. Uh, there's your 142 is the current rev that we're on. And uh, I think that number's up, uh, up to date, the 3,500 instances. Now, none of this, like I say, is going to be very exciting for people here that are running gigantic public clouds and stuff like that. Um, the numbers underneath represent our, our density of, of VMs. And that's uh, about, we're running about a 40 to 1 ratio of uh, VMs per host uh, and about 100 vCPUs, <clears throat> more or less. So we obviously oversubscribe. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, in the engineering space, where uh, we, we spun up, this was kind of interesting, about a month ago. We, uh, in, in, over the course of about a week, we spun up 12,000 virtual instances to explore some issues in EDA, um, just to kind of shake out the environment and stuff. Um, and, and that was a, was a really fun project, to just kind of uh, to whip up something like that and just fire it out there and be able to test a design environment that is actually going to run later on 12,000 physical machines on 12,000 virtual machines in order to see how it's going to function was, was a great thing to do. And I don't think we could have done it with anything other than KVM, frankly. It, it, KVM was the only choice for that. So that's a little bit about what we've done there. So uh, as far as KVM itself, uh, some of these benefits that we're, we've got here. Um, we did a study when we were getting started with our Essex Cloud. We uh, conducted a, 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 a study on standard cloud workloads, databases, and so forth. At that time, uh, KVM was already uh, at par or, or better than the marketplace offerings at that time. And some of the ones that were lagging behind have caught up by now. It seems like the hypervisor realm is about near stable on performance, at least from our perspective. Um, we chose it for stability. Um, it, it's, it's been uh, absolutely rock solid stable. I don't think anybody here would disagree with that. I, I, I'd be surprised if you want to talk about that. That'd be great. 
Um, obviously, the tight OpenStack integration. If you deploy OpenStack, you get KVM, thus the oceanographers and water comment. Um, the drinking our own champagne, of course, I mentioned we've got KVM developers in-house, so we're very interested in integrating it and using it. And uh, finally, for hypervisor efficiency, we get, uh, we get pretty good ratios. Um, and uh, for some of our uh, use cases, we're running up to uh, 70 VMs and uh, hundreds of vCPUs per host. And that usually works well, but not always. I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so this is, the, uh, this is the problem slide. We, 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 of course, everybody has problems when they deploy any kind of technology at all. Um, but there isn't much that hasn't either been solved at this point or, or, is, or is solvable. Um, I put Windows guests on here because Windows guests seem to be the most problematic thing. And yet, it, it, in our experience, almost everything we've come up with hasn't been a problem with the virtualization itself. And it's all been solvable. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out, and this, if there's one thing you take away from this, I'm not sure that there is much to take away from this, but if the one thing that you can take away from this, we actually had uh, a problem with uh, Windows guests on a performance level. And uh, when we were researching it, we, we were wrapping the, uh, we were using an image that we'd wrapped like about six months previously. And uh, then it was getting patched up to the current release, you know, using the Microsoft updater. And uh, we were working with it and working with it. One guy decided that he was getting tired of patching these instances every time that he, re, uh, you know, spun a new uh, a VM for this testing. So he just went ahead and built it up and rewrapped the image and then put it back out there and it actually got rid of the problem. So I'm not quite sure how that worked, but it turns out that Windows images are something that you want to rewrap frequently, bring them up to the most up-to-date service packs, then add the, the packs uh, over the top of them, because there's obviously some kind of non-deterministic behavior going on there. And the other thing is to check your flags. There's a lot of flags in KVM. If uh, this were a more content-heavy presentation, it probably I would describe some of them. Um, but there's a lot of great stuff around uh, um, taking advantage of CPU features. Uh, there's a dash CPU flag that can, uh, you can identify an Intel technology. Um, maybe a lot of people that are deploying smaller clouds may not know this. You, can, you, you get a default value from KVM when you launch it. Um, you can specify a dash CPU flag that will give you a bare minimum spec for the hosts that you're running on. So you can say dash CPU Westmere, for example, which will give you uh, all of the chipset features of the Westmere platform on Westmere and above. So that way, you're not running into any trouble with backwards compatibility if you're deploying wide. But you can take advantage of all of the chipset features going up and forward. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out was that uh, when you have big multi vCPU instances, like say a great big eight-way uh, machine or a, a database server or something like that, and you oversubscribe it onto a hypervisor with a bunch of other in instances, you can run into trouble. And I. Um, I don't know if it's true of the other hypervisors, because I haven't been running them at, at scale in my shop. I will say more about other hypervisors in a second. Um, but when you are oversubscribing these large multi vCPU instances, you can observe some performance problems, and even occasionally some, uh, uh, especially with Windows guests, which have issues with I.O. Uh, uh, delays, you'll, you'll occasionally even get corruption or, or crashing on the, the Windows host. So watch your oversubscription. If you keep the number of vCPUs pegged to the number of physical CPUs, you'll never have a problem. If you use nothing but single CPU instances and oversubscribe, you can go as high as you want. But if you start oversubscribing on multi uh, vCPUs, you might end up having a little bit of a trouble. So for future direction, which is the more interesting piece anyway, um, I'm going to say this about the hypervisor agnosticism. Like I said, it seems like hypervisors are really not, I mean, the big hotness here, right, is the containers. That's where everybody was. I saw the room downstairs with the crowd flowing out of it. Um, so I don't know if hypervisors are all that exciting to people anymore. It's more like the water. Um, <clears throat> so, so what is it that's uh, different about KVM? I mean, we, we're, let me back up on that a little bit. We obviously run more than KVM. We have a, a large install base of other vendor hypervisors, and we need to understand them and comprehend them from an OpenStack perspective and from other uh, uh, departments as well. Um, but what is it that's different about KVM versus those other hypervisors? It's, it's really how they're managed. Because if you get a vendor solution, you're getting a whole bunch of stuff with it that takes care of, of launching and, and deploying and so forth. And I'm not talking about OpenStack here. I'm just talking about all the stuff that uh, you use just to control the thing. If you've ever tried to launch a KVM command line, you know that that's, uh, 
that's a that's a risky proposition. There's a lot of flags. You manage it, of course, with libvirt, and then there's the universe of open source tools that surround it. So it's a little different, takes a little bit more um, understanding of the open source universe that surrounds KVM, um, but it is every bit as full featured, but it's just not KVM itself. Um, heterogeneous clouds. So we're, we're getting into this space now, and basically this portion of the talk is a blatant plug for my colleagues who are doing a talk on single control plane for OpenStack. It's in room B312 at uh, 520 PM. I encourage you all to go see it. This is, uh, we are going to put together a heterogeneous cloud uh, with a uh, single control plane, or actually we have done this, and uh, they're going to tell you all about that. And really, that's about it, actually. So I doubt there's many questions, but I'll take them if there are. Cool, thank you.